Hello, everyone. My name is Peter Bachfalushi, and I'm a technical sales specialist with ITM Management. Thank you for joining us at ITM University. Today's topic is fugitive emission leak detection with Teledyne FLIR. We kindly ask that you mute your microphone during the presentation. Our presentation should last between 40 and 45 minutes, and then we'll have time at the end for questions. We encourage you to ask questions at any time using the chat function. ITM Instruments has been working closely with Teledyne FLIR for many years. We pride ourselves in being a leading distributor of Teledyne FLIR. This is a result of our dedication to offering you our product expertise, service, and competitive pricing. Let's start today's webinar presentation. It's presented by Travis Weens. Travis is the Western Canada Regional Sales Manager for Teledyne FLIR. Travis has been with FLIR for nine years and is a level two thermographer specializing in optical gas imaging. Travis, we're ready for you. Please take it away. Thank you for that. Uh, Peter, thanks for, for inviting me along. Uh, here's a little bit of the agenda for the next 45 minutes. Uh, I do have a lot to go through, so I tend to talk fast. Like Peter said, please feel free to write into the chat section, and if we don't get your uh, questions answered right away, we will answer them at the end of the session. So basically, I want to talk a little bit about the history of FLIR. Uh, as Peter uh, mentioned, we've been working with ITM for several years. They're one of our biggest partners uh, globally, not just in Canada. And we're uh, very happy to uh, help, uh, help them out and help educate their customers. For those who don't know, FLIR was recently purchased out by Teledyne, and we are now known as Teledyne FLIR. And so you'll see this on here. Uh, we're still in the transition, so some slides will say FLIR, some slides will say Teledyne FLIR, but at the end of the day, uh, we all report to, uh, to Teledyne. Um, and this is sort of a little bit about that transition. The way we fit into Teledyne's uh, overview for the entire company is uh, we fit in very nicely in a niche area that they were not uh, experts in, and that's infrared imaging. So that's where our background is. It's literally in our name, forward-looking infrared is what FLIR stands for. So a little bit about FLIR Canada. We've been in, in Canada since 1965. Uh, we currently have about 40,000 cameras in Canada out in service. Um, and for those who've used the FLIR cameras in the past, uh, they are very rugged devices. So they are built to last. Uh, I have a lot of gas finders coming in uh, recently with the old uh, GF uh, gas find IR cameras coming in. Uh, for replacement because those cameras are 20 years old. So they've, they've definitely been out there lasting in the field. Uh, one testament to our group here in Canada is we have two full-time technicians. We're the only infrared company that has uh, in-house technicians that can work on gas finding equipment. Uh, anybody else has to take their equipment outside of the country. So I wanna start with a camera that is not traditionally used uh, for gas imaging, but uh, but I've recently found out that it works really, really well for this. And this is an acoustic imaging camera called the SI-124. Uh, very simple, it's a sound imager, that's what SI stands for, and 124 is the number of microphones. So they're very directional on here. You can see uh, up here that this is a power application, but for gas finding, it's, it's very similar. The reason I bring this up, up is it allows us to really pinpoint Accuracy, accurately uh, using the camera leaks and um, gas leaks chromonically. So we're not picking them up and being able to isolate, well, this is a methane leak and this is a propane leak. We have other cameras for that that we'll discuss further. But at this point, that camera uh, is really designed to uh, be your sort of first line of defense, to go out and see where do I have a leak on, on a vent or uh, a production site or something like this, what you're seeing here. This little meatball is indicating the highest concentration of sound that the camera is going to see. Lots of times I get questions like, well, can I use it in a compression station uh, where I've got a very noisy background? And yes, you can. I've, I've personally used them in a compression station last week and it worked fantastically. I actually have a couple images to show you on here from that inspection. Um, I've used these cameras on the belly of an F-18 fighter jet looking at pneumatic valves and being able to pick them up acoustically from the belly with the jet on. So they're very, very directional. 
Um, this is a little bit more for predictive maintenance, but the idea behind this is to show that we're able to pick up things ultrasonically that we can pick up a lot earlier than we can thermally. So that's why I say it's sort of the first line of defense. You know, so where do we look for air leaks? Um, in pneumatic systems, you can look at all kinds of things, but especially, you know, the systems with gas isn't that different. We're looking at tubing and hitting and uh, unions and, and pipe joints and things like that. So there's a lot of places to inspect using the cameras. Uh, here's a perfect example. Here's a guy using one out in the field. Uh, this was a propane test that we did uh, with a customer in, uh, in Montreal uh, just a few weeks ago. And we were able to open up the valve on there and see if we had a leak coming out. And as you can see, the, the meatball really kind of spoiled right into uh, finding that spot. And that's what we're finding with this camera is the accuracy uh, with the SI-124 is very, very high compared to other acoustic imagers out in the field. Um, you know, it, it's not necessarily just gas leaks. You can use it for compressed air. You can use it for steam systems, for natural gas. Uh, I recently had a uh, service company start to use it for nitrogen testing. So a lot of companies, when they go out and they build their production sites, they'll have uh, pressurized nitrogen in those systems because it's an inert gas and they want to look for very small leaks. Nitrogen being a small molecule can uh, slip through very tiny uh, leaks in, in seals and things like that. And, and up until we had this camera, we didn't really have a solution for that. We, we have other cameras that can see other gases, but because nitrogen is so prevalent in the atmosphere, it makes it very difficult to uh, image using a, a standard uh, gas camera. The acoustic camera really solves that problem and makes it uh, very simple. So and when, when I talk about it being sort of the baseline to start with, that's, that's why, because it does a bit of everything. So here is a perfect example. Um, I was in a compression station, this was last Tuesday, and I turned the camera on from across the room, I was able to pick up this leaking gauge. When I went back and verified it using a thermal camera and a gas camera, not only did we see the gas leak, but we could also see the cooling effect right at the seal to tell exactly where it was leaking. Uh, so they are very, very accurate tools. Uh, this was from the same site. Uh, we had a site glass that the SI-124 was able to pinpoint, and then we verified that gas leak using a GFX-320. So that's the other camera we're going to talk about a little bit later in the session here. Uh, it's a great combination between the two to have your initial pinpointing and then being able to verify, is that actually a gas leak or is it an air leak or those kind of things. Oh, so let's get into the uh, optical gas imaging itself. So this technology is field tested, it's proven. This is what the regulators are using. So whether you're dealing with the AER in Alberta, the BC Oil and Gas Commission, the Saskatchewan, um, Ministry of the Economy all use FLIR thermal imaging technology for optical gas imaging for uh, leak mitigation. So how does this technology work? Well, I'd love to say it's magic, but it's not the case. So everything in the universe that is above a um, absolute zero is going to emit some type of infrared signature. So we have a background that has a hot source, or even a cold source, but we're able to pick up the temperature reading out of it. And then between there, we'll have a gas that gets emitted. The gas comes in between the field. It's either going to absorb energy or it's going to emit more energy than the background. So a temperature difference between the gas and the background is critically important. Uh, even if it's a very, very small temperature change, two degrees or less is usually what we recommend, or two degrees or more, sorry, is usually what we recommend. The color of the plume, in some of the images you'll see, sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's cold. This will depend on how that energy is being absorbed. So in the electromagnetic spectrum, infrared is a lot larger than the visible realm. And because of that, we can't cover it with a single camera. We have multiple cameras that cover the entire spectrum. When it comes to optical gas imaging, we narrow those down to a mid-wave camera and a long-wave camera. These are two very different kind of technologies. So for, uh, when we talk about mid-wave cameras, we're talking about cryogenically cooled cameras. And when we're talking about long-wave cameras, these ones are very similar to your standard thermal imagers that use microbolometers as a scanner, um, but they do have a spectral filter. So we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. For those who haven't used infrared in the past, 
it's good to know that it operates a little bit differently than it visible light. So there's certain objects that the cameras can see through. Uh, they're great at seeing through polyurethane. So I get the question, you know, can I go out and do a scan in the rain? Yeah, you can. You can take a camera, you can throw it under a plastic bag or garbage bag, and it will see right through it as if there's nothing there. Uh, one of the limitations is glass. So the cameras don't see through glass. Um, so when, when I'm teaching people on how to go out and do a survey, uh, we always teach them, you know, do the wiggle dance, you know, move, move around, see if the object that you're looking at is actually just a reflection of yourself out there. Um, these gas cameras are specifically tuned for certain gases. So we're going to talk a bit about, about the cooled cameras first, and then we're going to get into some of the other technology. So the way the cooled cameras operate is we have a section where infrared comes in, and then we have a spectral filter on there. So depending on the gas that we're looking at, we may have a filter for a certain frequency. Uh, when we're looking at hydrocarbons, it's usually 3.3 to 3.5 microns. And anything that gets past that goes into our photon counter. And that entire shielding, this entire shielding is dropped down to about minus uh, 200 Celsius. So it's a refrigeration circuit. In the old days, you used to have to pour liquid nitrogen into the cameras. Uh, the cameras now use a Stirling cooler, so very similar to a refrigeration circuit. Um, and they operate quite, uh, quite well, but there is a cooling period to the camera. So when you notice, uh, if you've used the GF camera in the past, or if you're looking to get at one, you turn it on, it takes about five minutes to cool down to temperature, and then it's ready to go out and do that. And the reason why we have the spectral filter inside the housing is that increases our sensitivity. So we can see much smaller elements, uh, much smaller gas leaks than we would be able to see using a uh, warm filter. So let's talk about some of the limits. Uh, these are some of the initial tests that we did. You can see by the dates, these are back in 2005. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at butane and ethanol. Uh, butane in this case is showing us a absorptive plume. So that's what we refer to these black plumes. You'll notice that a lot of the imagery is done in black and white. Uh, so there is color that you can use as well, and sometimes that's an advantage. But generally we use uh, black and white because you've got more rods than cones in your eyes. So you can see higher contrast differences in black and white than we can in cones. On the ethanol side here, uh, we've got a emissive plume. So this means that the gas is actually emitting more energy than the background. Uh, these were the original laboratory tests, so we're looking at one meter away with zero wind speed and being able to uh, start our analysis that way. Um, so what are some of the things that can, uh, that can uh, mitigate your field testing are the things that we kind of eliminated in the lab. So things like wind speed, knowing what your leak rate is. Um, we did a lot of, of tests, uh, not just FLIR, but also third parties have done tests using these cameras out and uh, really kind of mapping down to see, okay, what's what's the smallest limit of, of a particular gas that we can view using that? And these are all published kind of things. Um, if we were all in a room together, this is the kind of test I would take and, and show you how these cameras actually operate. So this is a, just a butane Bic lighter, uh, basically about three grams per hour. And as long as the, uh, the camera is able to pick it up, uh, we've got the spectral filter in order to see that gas open it up and that's great because we can see that really fine. No, So how do these compare to say a traditional method 21 where you're using a sniffer to go out and do these kind of detections? Well, if you have that sniffer directly in the stream, you can pick it up quite easily. But if you move that sniffer just even a few millimeters, now all of a sudden you're completely missing that stream. You can have a completely different reading. So one of the things that is a big advantage when it comes to optical gas imaging cameras is that you're able to visualize these things from a big distance and capture a lot more data at a single time. So in this case, if I move that camera 20 feet away, I can still see that there's a leak um, from that distance using those cameras. So why do we have multiple cameras? Uh, we talked about the absorption, uh, uh, absorption of the cameras and being spectrally filtered. Well, different gases have different absorption within infrared, and that allows us to uh, pick them up, but we have to filter them for specific gases. So in this case here, we're looking at one of the entry, uh, one of the hydrocarbon cameras, the filter, these yellow things, the, the spectral filters on here. Uh, I believe this is our CO2 camera, uh, so this would be our GF346. 
we have a carbon dioxide and a carbon monoxide camera, depending on the applications. Uh, as we talked about earlier with uh, people uh, pressurizing their systems using nitrogen, some people like to use inert gases like CO2. Uh, I've got a few projects I'm working on right now, especially um, hydro, uh, hydro facilities like to pressurize using CO2. It's easy. To, uh, it's an inert gas. They won't have any issues, and they like to monitor it. Uh, so in this case, we've got another camera. This would be our GF three hundred four, which is our high, um, uh, CFC camera. And in this case, it's seeing R twenty two refrigerant. So if you've got large facilities, uh, ammonia plants, or or uh, uh, even arenas, can can be using uh, that kind of refrigerant, uh, or large buildings too, large commercial buildings. And then there is the SF6 camera. Uh, for those who don't know, SF6 or sulfur fluorohexide is used in transformers for, um, for high voltage equipment. And it's uh, an inert gas to humans, but it's very heavy. So what happens when they leak is this gas will come down and it kills off vegetation around it. So it's not necessarily dangerous to us, but it's environmentally damaging. So uh, the responsible uh, energy producers out there want to monitor and uh, make sure that they're uh, mitigating how much they're leaking that that information. So this camera, the one that's in blue, this would be the GF77. This is our long wave camera. It's got a little larger spectrum, but you can see both cameras will actually see that methane leak. Uh, so we have it covered with two different cameras at two different peaks. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the portfolio and then we'll kind of go into some details on them. So this, this is the FLIR offering. We talked about the SI-124 already. Um, the GF-77 or uh, GF-77A are the uh, long wave cameras, the one that we just saw in blue. And then the cameras above that are the cryogenically cooled cameras. And we have offers from fixed uh, units to drone mounted to handheld, which is kind of our traditional ones. And then any of these ones, the GF300, GFX320, uh, GF620, will work in conjunction with the QL322 quantify leaks. And we'll talk about that a little bit further um, down the presentation here. Our partners at ITM are well-versed in all of these cameras. Uh, I know Peter and Rodney for sure have gone through the optical gas imaging training courses, so they know this stuff inside and out. So feel free to lean on them on their expertise. Let's kind of break this up a little bit. So we talked about those specters. Here's how they reflect based on the cameras uh, that are out there. Let's break these down to different applications. So the hydrocarbon camera is here. The 30, uh, 343 is the CO2 camera, then the CO camera, the uh, uh, refrigerant camera, and then the SF6. So there is some overlap with the uh, microbolometer cameras as well. Depending on what lens is on it, you'll see that there's a low range and a high range version of the camera. Depending on which filter is on that camera, it can actually use uh, be used for some of those applications too. But we'll talk a little bit why you may want to look at a cryogenically cooled camera versus a um, long wave. So let's or let's talk with the long wave cameras. We'll talk about a little bit on here as to what they can be used for. So right on here, uh, primarily use is for methane. So if you are reporting to a fugitive emissions body uh, on all kinds of hydrocarbon leaks and you're using propane and butane and heptane, uh, this is not the camera for you. This, this camera is really designed specifically for methane, for small methane leaks, and being able to find those out in the field. Um, you know, what kind of what kind of user would use this? Well, it might be a production company that is uh, producing gas. Uh, and they already have a com service company that comes out and does a survey for them and, and does their uh, fugitive emissions tracking using one of the higher grade cameras. And they just want to view something in between. They want to find a leak when, uh, when their, their uh, survey company isn't out there. So this is a great option for that. Um, I've used this with a lot of power utilities that are using natural gas um, um, energy production facilities. And uh, they... Uh, love this camera for that application. The real advantage of this guy is that you can actually use it for dual use. You can see this is a full thermal camera. So if you're doing a mix of oil and gas uh, applications with methane, but you also want a camera that you can use reliably for a 
electrical inspection or mechanical inspection, uh, this camera really kind of covers both uses. So here's a couple of units that are uh, route, and you can see I did not take that off of there. So um, SO2 is another gas that can be seen with this camera, uh, and the methane leaks on here. There are some cross comparisons between the methane leaks and the um, cryogenically cool cameras, and you will see a much larger plume with the cryogenically cool cameras because they are more sensitive. So this camera, the GF77HR, is just basically a lens swap. So we put a different filter on the lens, and now we're able to see ammonia leaks in SF6. So in this case here, this little puff of gas is coming out. For those who aren't familiar, with uh, our cameras, we have a technology called HSM. It's called high sensitivity mode. And what it does is it takes the last image of the uh, shot and then overlays it over the new one. And the reason why we do this is it allows us to see very, very small leaks in high detail. And that's what you're seeing here is this is HSM. So these little things buzzing around, these aren't, uh, these aren't meteorites, they're just flies in the background. But, uh, but it also shows that how small a leak that we can take off with, with one of these. And then here's some shots with that camera, uh, another SFS leak and an ammonia leak. Uh, for the, uh, those who are using ammonia gas, uh, this is very dangerous. Uh, you know, there's, there's been lots of cases, especially here in Alberta, where, where people have been killed by uh, ammonia gas. So being able to track that at transfer stations or between uh, mounting on, uh, on vehicles uh, trailers and tractors and things like that, uh, it's very important to be able to, to see that gas. And that's what these cameras are really about, is, is, is not only seeing the lost product, but also saving people's lives using, using these cameras. So I talked about a good, better, best. Uh, good being the SI-124, the better being the GF-77. Uh, now I'm going to talk about our best range of cameras. So these are our highest, most sensitive units. I love this footage because everybody can relate to it. So this is one of the very first tests that we did out in the field. Uh, this is why when you're filling up your car, uh, make sure you're not using your cell phone for one, and two, uh, make sure you're, you're getting rid of your spark because that gas does actually circulate right around it. You can see it here, it's just, it's pouring out. And this is typical. I've, I've taken my cameras out and done the exact same tests. Uh, as you can see, the camera doesn't really tell you what gas do you have? It's not a spectral analyzer. It's not going to say, I've got a methane leak, I've got a propane leak. What it's going to do is give you a very binary response to that gas. If there is a gas that the camera is capable of seeing with that spectral filter, and there is enough gas present that the camera can see it with enough temperature difference between the gas and the background, this is a perfect application, uh, then you will definitely see a leak. Go to the next guy here. Okay, so I wanted to show you a couple different examples. Bear with me here, having technical difficulties. There we go. Okay, so here's some perfect examples of field tests. Uh, tank emissions are very common. We find these almost on every facility I go up to, uh, unless it's been inspected recently. So in this case, we've got a massive plume, this thief hatch is open, and you've got just a ton of gas going out into the atmosphere. Uh, definitely not something we want to see from an environmental perspective, but also from a production side, because that's that's product going in the atmosphere. That's that's money that you're you're losing. Um, compression spat, uh, packing here, very common application as well. So I always check compression seals when I'm out on a site uh, doing a test in the field. Very very common here. One thing to note though, when you're doing a compression uh, test using the cameras, and if you put it into the HSM mode you may see heat waves off, off those compressors. Don't be fooled to think that that's actually a gas leak. And that's one of the things that we teach in our optical gas imaging course is how to discern the difference between the two. Down here, we've got a pipe leak uh, underground or underwater. Uh, this is the HSM mode. You can see where this gas is going. So somebody must have uh, done something wrong here and then they've got a pipe leak. It could, could have been frozen. I don't know. I didn't take the image. Uh, the other picture here, this is taken with a GF. I'm just going to restart this guy. 
So this image here is taken from a helicopter with a GF320. There's a leak right there. So this is an underground pipeline. We can kind of see this by two ways. Um, when it flies back here, we'll look at that again. Uh, there's a couple ways that we can tell what's going on here. One, we've got a very cold concentration out of there. Whenever you've got a leak uh, from high pressure to low pressure, you're going to have a cooling effect. But here's the plume. This is the massiveness of that, that plume coming out of here. We can see all that gas going on. Um, if you guys are interested in seeing more, uh, would uh, go to uh, YouTube and look up the Alyssa Canyon gas leak. This is one that was in California about five, six years ago. And uh, it's uh, a massive leak that was all caught by our cameras as well. So let's go to the next one. So why do we have these different cameras? Well, for different applications, right? So this is a CO2 detection camera. In this case, we're uh, on a generator site here and we wanna see what's going on with the leaks. So the camera's due to a visual shot and you can switch it into uh, a mode that gives you the gas, and then in this case, uh, also the HSM. So very high sensitivity, and we can see the gas coming out through there. So, um, you know, what are some kind of other applications for CO2 leaks? Um, we've actually used them on outpatients. So people who've had uh, heart surgery and things like that to make sure that they're breathing properly. Uh, I know Peter's had some experience with, uh, with cattle, looking at uh, snorting cows to see how they uh, are breathing properly. So there's all kinds of different applications for out there. Uh, in this case, this is a hydrogen leak, and we're able to see hydrogen gas coming out of there. Uh, here's a pretty common site is going to be a, uh, a union that's uh, not sealed properly. You can actually see this gentleman here snorting out. Whenever he exhales, the camera's picking it up. So not the best example to be in the line of fire, but uh, if I rewind that, you can see that there is actually a leak coming out of this valve at the same time. And that's where that HSM technology comes in very handy. It's, it, it really kind of isolates those small, tiny leaks and gives you a lot more detail as to what you would normally be able to see, even, even in the thermal realm, uh, certainly more than you would, would see anything visually. In this case, this is a carbon monoxide camera, so perfect for uh, large uh, facilities that are, are producing that gas or, or using exhaust fumes. Uh, in this case, it looks like you've got a, an overhead pipe and there's just a, a plume of this gas coming out. So carbon monoxide, as we all know, is very, very dangerous gas to humans, um, can put you to sleep and, and, and even kill you in some cases. So uh, it's definitely something that we want to monitor using the cameras, um, especially if there's anything going off and you, and you need to really kind of isolate where is that gas coming from. Uh, a couple other examples here. So this looks like it's a, it's a vent. It's venting out CO2 gas. Uh, this is a blast furnace that apparently has a leak as well. So lots of different applications on where you can use these things. So they goggle the valve, or they get the valve up there. We can actually see it here without the HSM mode. That's a pretty massive plume of carbon monoxide gas. Definitely something that wants to be avoided or will need to be repaired very, very quickly. GF304, refrigerant gases. Um, this camera is used for a lot in like food production and storage and, and petrochemicals, uh, automotive and air conditioning kind of applications. So it picks up a ton of different uh, refrigerants. A lot of the, the uh, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought here. A lot of the uh, hydrocar or not hydrocarbons, the fluorocarbons have a very similar type of uh, thermal signature. So we're able to pick those up using the cameras. So R22, for anybody who's used to work in refrigeration like I did, that was you know, pretty common in a household. Uh, about 20 years ago, we switched to R134A, uh, which is pretty common in larger buildings, so chillers and, and uh, those types of facilities. And then the SF6 ammonia camera. So hopefully what you're, what, what I'm trying to get across here and hopefully you're realizing is that there is a lot more sensitivity the higher you get up in the food chain. So the SI-124 is a good pinpointer. It'll say, here's my leak. And then if I come in with a GF-77, I can say, yep, that's a methane leak or an SF-6 leak. But I get into these higher grade cameras and I put them in the HSM mode and I can really pick up very, very tiny disturbances and, and small trace leaks coming out of these pieces of equipment. And that's, that's really kind of why you go for a higher grade camera is to pick up the smaller leaks. 
another perfect example here. We've actually had a facility here in uh, in Calgary where we went out and uh, took this shot using this camera. And when we went up and did a physical inspection on there, there was actually a circle marked right on it that said leak. So they knew that they had an issue, it just hadn't been repaired. Uh, and again, ammonia gas here. So a lot more on the sensitivity and the plume that we're able to pick out. So let's look at some comparisons between an uncooled camera and a cooled camera. Basically, there's about two or three different units. Um, the biggest thing comes down to the sensitivity. So a cryogenically cooled camera uh, will give you a smaller millikelvin rate. Millikelvin are how uh, thermal sensors are uh, compared to one each other. So whether it's our camera or one of our competitors units out there, they all have a millikelvin rate. And the smaller the number, the more sensitive it is. And that really comes down to this next line is how small of a gas leak can we see using those cameras? Well, in this case, um, with a GF320 or a GFX320, which is the same sensor, uh, I can pick up 10 parts per million per one meter of gas. Uh, and that's how we usually measure them out because we're looking at volumetrics. It's all based on a single meter. And then uh, as a comparison, the GF320 would be able to pick up 100 parts per million. So it does matter the sensitivity and the size of the leak. Uh, especially when we're looking at methane by itself, the 320 by 240 detector is able to pick up a 0.6 grams per hour leak, whereas a long wave camera would pick up 2.7 grams per hour. And there's a little bit more variety in the gases that we're able to pick up. So a lot more hydrocarbon chains are available with the smaller um, detection because we're able to pick up smaller differences, we're able to pick up more gases. Whereas this camera is uh, methane, nitrous oxide, and sulfur dioxide only. And quantification. So if you are looking to add a quantification tool where you need to see, okay, well, how large is that mass leak? Then uh, you will need another piece of equipment called a QL320. And we're about to talk about that in just a second. So quantification is not available on the lower end cameras, but it is available on the higher end. But here's sort of a side-by-side -side comparison shot. Um, so we've got a cool camera and we've got a uncooled camera using a different color palette. And you can see the leaks are very similar. So these are, you know, it's not a far, not a far cry from the difference, as long as the gas you're looking at is able to be picked up by that camera. Uh, this is the one I was talking about earlier. So the uncooled camera and the cool, uh, sorry, the uncooled cameras here and the cool cameras over here. The biggest difference here is the amount of other gases you're able to pick up. So in the case of the GF77, we're looking at strictly methane. In the case of, this is probably a GF320, uh, that camera can see a lot more hydrocarbons. So uh, it may also be all methane and it's just picking up more of it because it's more sensitive, but more than likely there's, there's a combination of other gases built into there. Uh, here's a perfect example of the uh, cooled camera using HSM mode and then the uncooled camera using a normal mode. So you can see the plume is a lot more accentuated by the HSM mode. In this one, we can still really visualize the leak quite easily. So it it does, it is a useful tool. You know, where do you use these things? Well, we can use it on the production side. We can use it on uh, the transfer side, getting the getting the units out, even down to local business. I even had gas stations phone me and ask me about being able to trace uh, using the cameras. So there really isn't anywhere that you can't use these cameras. I do recommend though, if you're looking on the production uh, processing plant side, going a little bit more sensitive. And I would probably go with the ATEX rated camera. So that would be the GFX 320. Uh, as Peter and I uh, have found out over the last couple of years, that is probably the most common camera that, that uh, the market is uh, looking at right now, just because it's easy to use out in the field. So I'm not sure how I can shut that volume down, but hopefully it's not too loud. Uh, same kind of thing here. So this is a, a GF77 and a GF320 out in the field, cross comparison between the two. Um, on the GF, 77 it will tell you what lens is on that camera because you can swap those lenses out on the gf uh, 320 cameras it doesn't because that spectral filter is built into the inside of the camera 
So it's not going to be changed out in the field. Let's talk a little bit about quantitative imaging. I think we're getting pretty close on time here. Um, so this is an additive tool that is designed to work with the GF320, GFX320, and GF620 cameras. So any of the cryogenically cooled hydrocarbon cameras. What does it do? Well, essentially, we throw a little bit of data into the camera and we, we tell it, what's the temperature difference? What gas am I looking at? How far away is the camera from the, uh, the target of interest? In this case, we're looking at this leaking valve. And what happens is this device will calculate, based on the atomic weight of the gas, how much gas is flowing from inside of the circle to outside of the circle very quickly. So this will do this in, in under, under a minute. And it will give you a flow rate. So it will give you either grams per hour or a PPM, depending on how you've got the camera set up. Um, and that helps for your decision making. I, I look at this as a decision making tool camera. Uh, enhancement. You know, do I need to do a complete shutdown because this is a large leak and we need to repair it right away? Uh, or is this something that can wait till the next shutdown because it's a trace leak and it only works when this equipment is under pressure? Uh, of course, consult your regulators because they're changing the rules all the time. Uh, the new version of the ECCC that's coming out is talking about a 30-day uh, window that if you find a leak, you have to repair it within 30 days. So, you know, what do you need to go out there and be successful with this device? You can see that this was the original setup. So before we had the GFX camera, uh, we had the GF320. You could hardwire it under this device. You don't have to do that. You can actually take the cameras into the field and do the initial tests, find your gas leaks, and then do your quantification after the fact. So, you know, make sure you guys are safe when you're out there. Don't be out there using a, um, a power connected device in a potentially explosive environment. We wanna make sure you guys are safe. Um, so what we recommend having out there is, is a way to tell what the background temperature is, the wind speed, um, tape measure or laser distance finder to, to find out how far away you are from that target. And then uh, that's the kind of information that gets inputted. And then once we've got that in there, um, like I said, you just run the equipment and it will give you your quantification out. And that's kind of it in a basic nutshell. Uh, I think we're a little bit early, I'm about eight minutes. Um, so let's open up the questions. Yeah, thanks very much, Travis. That was excellent. Um, we, we do have a question here. It's from uh, Steve. Uh, he says, are any of the cameras useful to determine the highest concentration of stagnant H2 hydrogen in an enclosed space as opposed to a leak? In a closed space, that's pretty difficult because you generally need to have a large temperature difference between the gas and the background. And hydrogen being such a small element, um, if it's the same temperature as the background because it's a closed environment, um, that could be a difficult to trace out for sure. Now, I'm not saying it's not possible. The, the best chance for you to be able to find those kind of leaks would be um, when the equipment's been off for a while, you first initially start it up, uh, things start to get under pressure, and then you're, you're going to be able to see those leaks probably the, the, the best way possible. Does that answer the question? Yes, I think so. But hy hydrogen, did, did any of the cameras pick up hydrogen? Or uh, Well, we did see a hydrogen leak on one of the cameras. I believe it was the GF343. Um, yeah. Generally with hydrogen, you might be better off using the SI-124, um, to be perfectly honest, because you're gonna be able to pick that up acoustically earlier. And especially in that environment where everything is stagnant, temperature-wise, everything's kind of mitigated. The back wall and the gas are the same temperature. So you may have very difficult time trying to find that. Whereas the acoustic camera doesn't require any temperature at all. It will be able to find the leaks based on the harmonics of that gas coming out of whatever seal or packing that's that's damaged. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another, Darren asks that, he asks to, about the accuracy of the QL320. Uh, he's had some feedback that it's not uh, super, super accurate. Do you do you have anything on that specification or do you have any feedback I on do, that? I do. So uh, it's not just me saying it. We've had third-party testing through uh, the... Um, Environmental Protection Agency in the United States has done some field studies with it. The Kinkawi Group in Europe have done field studies with it. And also there is a published study from the Saskatchewan Research Council from a couple of years ago. 
all three studies basically found that using a QL320 with a known leak, uh, when the information is entered properly, will give a variance of plus or minus 20%, which is well within industry norms. Um, if you look at traditional method 21, um, using a sniffer out in the field, like we saw on that image, where we traced the sniffer with the lighter, um, those studies that have been done side by side, or blind studies, have shown a variance of minus 20 to plus 600, depending on what uh, high flow sampler or, or unit they've been using out there. So yeah, there has been some, um, there has been some concern about the accuracy out in the industry for years. Um, not so much from us, obviously, you know, we, uh, we partnered up with Providence Photonics. These, these were the gentlemen that built the algorithm. We liked how much their technology and how accurate it was to the point where we actually purchased their, their company. Um, and then they're now a FLIR product. Now, that being said, um, you know, the, the best, best practice would probably be use both if you're out there. Um, but the, the accuracy of the QL320 continues to get better as the technology gets better, as the algorithm gets better. Uh, and most recently, uh, south, south of the border in Mexico, uh, they have decided that the QL320 is the instrument to be used for looking at uh, mass flow leaks. So their, their government has, uh, has mandated that the QL320 is the tool to be used down there. Uh, for those type of applications. And if it wasn't, uh, if the accuracy wasn't good, they wouldn't be doing that. And I think some of it could also be user error. Like you said, um, in Q mode on the camera, you have to input the distance you are from the leak, the wind speed, uh, how much pressure the system is under, and yeah. the ambient temperature. There's, and there's definitely some variances for that. Yeah, I mean, that brings up a good point, Peter. Um, there's definitely some variances in how the input is done. Um, one of the things to note for the, the people who have not used a QL320 in the past or, or interested in looking at one is I do recommend getting some training on it. Um, I, I recommend getting training on any of the cameras, whether you're doing an SI-124 or a QL320 or a GF320. Definitely, if you're investing that kind of money into a tool, invest a little bit more into getting trained how to use that tool properly. And, and ITM can certainly help and get you set up with, with our training courses on those, on those equipment. Um, but yeah, user error can be a factor for sure. Um, I've personally used the QL320 on a site where we had a, a flow rate monitor. Uh, this was with a local company here in, in Calgary. Uh, it was our test facility out of town. And I basically told them, I said, don't, don't tell me what the flow rate is. I'm going to tell you what I can see with my camera. Every single time they turned it on, I was within 5%. So um, I am very happy using that camera and that technology out in the field to find a leak. Uh, if I'm within 5% accuracy in, a, in an open field test, that's pretty darn good. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. I think uh, that's it for the questions today. Um, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to email us. On behalf of ITM Instruments University, we want to thank you for attending our webinar today. I hope you found it informative and helpful. ITM is available to assist you in any way. Just visit us on itm.com for anything you need. Yeah, so at the end of the webinar, we're going to send out a survey. Please answer it honestly, and uh, it'll help us make webinars better for next time. And in the next few months and weeks, we're going to be having more webinars. You can look at the webinar section on our website to find out what those topics are going to be. And uh, finally, as a thank you, one person that attended today will receive $100 gift card to itm.com. So again, thanks very much. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time.